please welcome the panel on A Functional Approach to Healing, moderated by author, journalist, and host of the 10% Happier podcast, Dan Harris. Hey, everybody. How are we doing? Welcome. Uh, I thought we would start, if it's okay with the panelists, uh, by having you just run down. Uh, maybe I'll start with Satya and have you introduce yourself and just say a little bit about what your background is and what you're excited to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So hello everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, my background is uh, full of a good experience from law school till uh, marketing, but my, my base, my being is really connected to healing and to spirituality. So what I do in, in my life now, the past 15 years, is to combine science and spirituality, ancient traditions and modern therapy. So I live uh, a long time in Amazon uh, with indigenous tribes that I don't like to call even tribes, you know. They are just people like us, but with a total different setup. And I've been learning with um, to work with them to awake consciousness because what we see is normally the cause, the root of diseases is a lack of self-awareness that bring us to have consequence on the physical body. So we work on the roots of diseases and not on the consequence of having a disease. That's why we call ourselves healers and not doctors. And I won't say that I'm not a doctor. I believe the union between um, medical care and self-awareness can be a step into a new society that we all need in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. I should have said your full name before I asked you to start talking, but maybe you can help me with the pronunciation. Satya Rita Rocha. So Satya is a name that I took it in a commitment to work with truth, means truth in Sanskrit, and Rita Rocha is my birth name. Ah, okay, so it's a, a Portuguese p pronunciation. Yes, okay. Rita Rocha. Okay, awesome. Thank you, and nice to meet you. Welcome. Uh, it, let's move down the line now to Missy. Missy okay. Larson is Vice President of Philanthropy at doTERRA International. Did I get, is it doTERRA? It's Do doTERRA, doTERRA, very doTERRA. good. Okay. Yeah, which means gift of the earth. And they, um, the seven founders put together this gift of the earth of essential oils 15 years ago. Just last week was their 15th year anniversary. The whole um, idea behind it was if you, can t if you can find the purest elements with botanicals on the earth and get them into an essential oil element that you really and get them into every household, they can solve a lot of problems that are right now trying to be solved by other ways in pharmaceutical. Um, so we'll talk about today and hopefully get into the place of how do you know things are pure? How do you work um, in a whole purity system, knowing from the people that you're working with, from the um, knowing that you're ethical, sustainable, knowing the people that you're working with from the very ground. We source in about 45 different nations. And then I oversee a philanthropic model um, that is integrated called Co-Impact Sourcing that we utilize um, our sourcing areas and support with social impact projects. I'm supposed to be letting you guys do your introductions, but I have to ask, what, I've never known or understood what are essential oils? So it's the essence of, it's the, the, the smell, the, the essence, so the, the, the um, basis of a, a plant or a botanical. So like with frankincense, it's actually in Somaliland, um, Oman, and Egypt off of a tree, and then it comes and then you, you pull it down into the oils that come from that and utilize that as a natural product. So you're taking the essence of, of key plants yeah, and so making them Yeah, so lavender yeah. or, you know, we have a number, 100 and something different oils, so that Siberian fir to frankincense to myrrh to, you know, goes back in the Bible. Yes, <laughs> just thinking about that. Um, okay, thank you, appreciate that. Jill Carnahan is the founder and medical director of Flatiron Functional Medicine, also, also the author of Unexpected uh, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith. Jill, can you give us a little bit more of your bio and what you want to talk about today, please? Sure, so I practice functional medicine in Boulder, Colorado. Um, back in the early 2000s, I went to medical school and got an allopathic degree and got the tools of pharma pharmaceuticals and uh, surgery. 
But my goal is to reach the medical system with the other options that are available. As a functional medicine expert, we use root cause analysis. So we're looking at the biochemical and physiological changes in the body that actually precede disease and things that were considered irreversible in the realm of functional medicine where we look at root cause and where you are on the trajectory of either health or illness, we can actually reverse the irreversible. And so I'm here to influence the influencers, teach the teachers, change the doctors, and introduce a new way of doing medicine. The toolbox that we use is lifestyle, diet, nutrition, but going way beyond that. If you've ever seen Dr. House, that medical detective show, that's me. <laughs> I do medical mysteries and try to solve the root cause of very complex and chronic illness. So I see people all over the US, and especially those who have been to multiple medical centers and maybe have mysterious symptoms like headaches or fatigue or immune dysfunction. And we now know this field of psychoneuroimmunology is really at the core of so many illnesses. If I think about functional medicine, we have toxic, toxic load and infectious burden. And pretty much everything I'm doing is analyzing the body on that scale and looking at what inflammatory and immune responses happen when we have these insults in our toxic world. So I am passionate about inspiring you, inspiring other physicians to think outside the box, and also to give answers to those who have not had hope for health and healing. Thank you. Dan Butner is the founder of Blue Zones LLC. Dan. Uh, Butner. Go for it. Butner. Otherwise my, known as Butner. Yes. My apologies. <laughs> my apologies. No, no worries. We're, we Butner. just met a minute ago. Um, yeah, so I'm a National Geographic fellow, one of the hats I wear. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, that's a fancy name for professional truant. But a long time ago, I, I set off to reverse engineer longevity, uh, worked with a team of demographers to find the statistically longest lived areas around the world and dubbed them blue zones. We found five of them and then uh, set off with a, a team of advisors to find the common denominators or the correlates. And uh, remarkably, no matter where you go and you find people uh, living the longest, and this is in the variety of um, uh, longevity where we're gonna live to 120. This is uh, making it to uh, age 95, which seems to be the maximum average life expectancy of the human species right now. Um, but making it to that age without chronic disease. And uh, about 12 years ago, I've written, written several books and several articles for National Geographic. And about 12 years ago, I got to thinking, could you manufacture a blue zone? In other words, could you take the principles that we find in these areas where people are manifestly living longer and better lives um, and uh, tr uh, uh, transport them to America? And we started with a small uh, city in the prairies of Minnesota, Albert Lee, Minnesota. And within uh, two and a half years, we were able to um, raise their life expectancy, uh, representative sample by about three years, and we lowered their health care costs by about 30%. Um, and based on that, um, we ended up scaling it, and now we're in 70 cities uh, nationwide, uh, cities as big as Phoenix and uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and Naples, Florida, and every city we've been in so far for more than four years, we've managed to lower the BMI. And I actually get paid by insurance companies for outcomes. So if I can lower the BMI of a city by 1%, a city with a million people, it usually occasions about a quarter of a billion dollars in healthcare savings. So I take great pride in taking the wisdom from these traditional people living around the world and applying it in a modern context. And I, I take even greater pride in the discovery, which I just made for my new best friend, Jeff, <laughs> founder of functional medicine, that I'm also doing functional medicine. So yeah. <laughs> then I'll pass the baton. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dan Buechner. Appreciate that. Uh, Jeffrey Bland, founder and president of Big Bold Health. Uh, let it rip. And thanks, and thanks all of you for uh, allowing us to apply with some new ideas, hopefully uh, some news to use. So I had an epiphany personally uh, about 1982. I was a medical school professor, kind of on a, on a standard track. Um, and I took a sabbatical leave for two years, invited by Dr. Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner at his institute at Stanford. And uh, it was a life change. I did a crazy thing, gave up my tenured faculty position to start a company to teach doctors how to do uh, nutritional medicine in their practice. Had no business plan, had no way of uh, thinking how I was gonna support family, had uh, young kids, a mortgage, all those things. Somehow it worked out over those years. Uh, and I've learned throughout these years that there is something more than what I was taught in school. What I was taught in school is that um, 
if you want to improve people's health in the medical system, you want to reduce the risk of disease by certain biomarkers, the, the kind of the standards of identity that we use, cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, um, blood sugar, and so forth. Um, what I came to recognize is that those are false gods. They actually don't teach you really what the person wants to know. What they want to know is how they're functioning, how their physical functioning, their cognitive, emotional, and behavioral and metabolic function, which are not quantified in medicine at all. And we say it again, they're not quantified in medicine. I spent all those years never learning about what's really important that relates to resiliency and to the uh, compression of morbidity, which are functional indicators. I learned about pathophysiological, cytological, histological indicators of the ICD uh, nomenclature, the International Classification of Disease, which doesn't relate to what people really want to know. That then became the birthing for me of, of the Institute for Functional Medicine and the concept of functional medicine in 1990. How do you distinguish between functional medicine, alternative medicine, and integrative medicine? So I look at functional medicine, and I think Dr. Carnahan said it beautifully, as an operating system. It's not a medicine that you know, is standard of practice. We don't have conventional rules. We don't have protocols. What we have is a zeitgeist, a way of thinking about that person related to the uh, complex interaction of their genes our unique book of life in 23 chapters that we got no ability to sign up for, it just was the luck of the draw. But in those genes are all sorts of pluripotential outcomes, all the way from magnificent health and exhaustive uh, you know, bliss to uh, disasters. And they all reside within each one of our genomes. And the difference between those that have the blissful life and those that don't is the experiences that we have, which are modifiable. Therefore, functional medicine, and why Dan Buettner is uh, producing and, uh, and really a leader in community-based functional medicine, whether he knew it or not, is it's delivering the things that really make a difference. We spend $3.75 trillion on chronic disease management, 83% of our healthcare budget, uh, and yet those are not actually treated at the causative level. They're treated at the uh, phenotypic level to reduce symptoms. There's something wrong. When we talk about cures, it's wonderful the progress we're making. I'm awe-inspired by this meeting and the kind of things we see of cures. But the real uh, below the waterline uh, issue are these chronic issues that are related to the mismatch between a person's genes and their environment and lifestyle. That's where the action can really change the, the healthcare system. And dedock the healthcare system from the disease care system. Right now it's all disease centric. That's how I was trained. Everything was around a disease. Even when we talk about risk reduction, it's disease risk reduction. It's not related to the outcome that people are really looking for is health span. And, and reducing the reducible uh, aspects of disease. Let me just stay with functional medicine uh, in a specific way, a narrow way for a minute. Jill, let me go to you. Um, all of this sounds super intriguing. It sounds commonsensical in an in a elevated way. And yet, functional medicine has really fierce critics who deride it as quackery. So what do you say? I want to give you an opportunity, and both of you actually, to, to push back against the critics. What are they getting wrong? Outcomes. <laughs> so um, I, 20 years ago, was integrative medical director at a hospital system. And I remember very vividly sitting in the board meeting as a medical head of a department. And the CEO showed us a slide of each department and the beds filled. And I sat there and looked at that slide and said, I am in the wrong location because I'm trying to keep people out of the hospital. And that marker did not resonate with me or what I was doing in integrative or functional medicine. So the real thing is um, when we deal with a car accident, a heart attack, some um, acute illness, our medical system in the US is still one of the very best in the world. But if you have an autoimmune disease, you have thyroiditis, you have lupus, you have MS, you have obesity, you have diabetes, drugs don't cure these diseases. But functional medicine, when we go to root cause and we look at the gut and we look at the immune system, and we look at the metabolic markers that are creating disease and inflammation, we can actually find out what happened to induce, we call them antecedents and, and uh, mediators, that keep that condition going. And we go to that level and change the inputs and actually change the trajectory. So like I said in the beginning, we've seen things that were considered irreversible to become reversed. So years ago when I was in that medical clinic and my colleagues, the rheumatologist, the gastroenterologist, the neurologist said, what in the world is Dr. Jill over there doing? The proof was their patients came back to them off the meds, off the immune modulating drugs, and they said, 
Dr. Jill, you know, help me with this. And all of a sudden they started asking me, what are you doing over there? And that's the way we change this, is we show outcomes, we show healthier health span and lifespan. And I want to just mention, in this realm of autoimmunity, the gut is huge, but one of the other passions is our soils, because we used to say autoimmune disease begins in the gut, and I believe now it's actually beginning in the soil. So our soils matter to us as health and um, in functional medicine. We'll come back to you, Jeffrey. The, just, just to be clear, I mean, the, I am super intrigued by the uh, idea of um, addressing root causes. I'm primarily Mr. Meditation these guys, but it, these days. But I've been. It's been pointed out to me that the root of meditation and medicine is the same for a reason. These are modalities to help people heal, and I think meditation can have, and also just working with the human condition and human thriving, human flourishing can really have a, a whole, can be a holistic approach. That being said, I was surprised as I started researching your field, the extent of the criticism. So I just want to give you, as well as, uh, just as I do with Jill, a chance to address it. For example, if, even if you just Google it, uh, uh, functional medicine, the first result on Wikipedia says, quote, functional medicine is a form of alternative medicine that encompasses a number uh, of unproven and disproven methods and treatments. So totally wrong or partly right? What, where, what do you make of these pushbacks? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, a, a good critic keeps you sharp and it refines your model. And, and we like criticism. We like these points of controversy, as it were, trying to seek out a healthcare system that really deducts from disease care, which is so costly, both financially and, and in terms of experiential uh, adversity. And so the functional medicine model is built around a central principle that was very different than the way I was trained in a traditional medical school education. We, uh, I'm gonna make this, this really quickly kind of simple, and probably overly simple. Uh, we would study, uh, as Jill will, will I, I think, confirm, a uh, uh, chapter at a time or a textbook at a, uh, at a time. And then we would close the textbook and we'd take a test. So it would be the gastrointestinal system, it would be the nervous system, it would be the cardiovascular system, it would be, and we'd go through systems approach, each as if it was individually partitioned and compartmentalized from anything else. Then we would take a test and think, okay, now I can move to the next organ system. And then if we really got deep in this, we could become a super specialist, knowing more and more about it, uh, less and less until we knew everything about nothing. I said that as an exaggeration just to make my point. The functional medicine model, however, recognizes in a systems biology approach what we've learned in the 21st century. And that is that all these organ systems are interconnected. So when Dr. Carnahan talks about the immune system connected to the gut microbiome, connected to the nervous system, these are systems that are working 24-7, 365 by cross-communication. They don't just work independently, they're working together. Therefore, if you're intervening at a systems level, you're treating the cause, not the effect. So when people criticize functional medicine, it's that they really don't understand the basic science that underpins this org. This, we have over 20,000 references from the peer-reviewed literature supporting these concepts. But it takes at least 20 years for medicine to catch up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we talk about advancing cures, it cuts across everything, not just treatment of end-stage disease, but the actual improvement of human performance often takes the disbelievers as, as I think, uh, who was it, the, uh, the, the classic Nobel Prize winner in physics who said, uh, quantum theory was accepted one funeral at a time. Uh -huh. And that's what happens in medicine. You, you have to have this evolutionary transition. But right now we're compressed uh, with AI and all the things that are happening. What used to take 10 years now takes a year. So we're in a very, very advancing, quick change in which now medical schools are adopting this question, this whole approach. We're seeing the you know, Cleveland Clinic has a Center for Functional Medicine that's one of the most active clinics in the Cleveland Clinic. We're seeing the VA and the DOD picking up on this with now veterans approaches. So it's catching on. Uh, Dan, any uh, any reconsideration of whether you want to be called a functional? No, I'm very proud to be among these people. <laughs> you know, you, the, so the, you have to realize that almost nobody makes money if you stay healthy. Pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. rely on you to get a prescription. Uh, hospitals rely on you to rent a bed. Most doctors, even though I know they want to cure you, at the end of the day, their pay paycheck relies on you getting sick and coming in for a test or a procedure. And my colleagues up here are, you know, I know enough about it that there's a proactive approach. And the fact that, that um, Missy? Yes, Jill. 
Jill, sorry, Missy's next time. Yeah. Uh, is talking about the the uh, m microbiome beginning with the soil. Tells me that th they they are they are considering the problem as a whole, not some sort of a surgical intervention where you could you know be reimbursed on. So, could could I make a quick comment because I want to do a segue to to Missy. So um, Jill talked about the soil, and one of the things that I've uh, I've learned we've learned. Um, and I'm, I'm now into regenerative agriculture. I never thought I was going to be a farmer, but I, in this portion of my career, now we own farms in upstate New York, and we're bringing back this ancient food, 4,000 years old, called tartary buckwheat, and blah, blah, blah. But we, we're doing by regenerative agriculture techniques, and what we learn is the mycorrhiza of the soil directly relates to the personality of the genes of seeds and how they express their function into the plant, which then influences how that plant germinates its final product, seed or fruit, and how that then, when consumed by animals, produces an effect of consistent outcome that's related to the health of the soil. We've actually tracked this. We just published a paper on this, soil mycorrhiza and its effect on tartary buckwheat flavonoids. So this construct that we have to take a much broader view of health, starting with the fundamental things upon which we're all nourished, all parts of the ecosystem, even the planet has its own immune system. The carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur cycles are part of the plant's immune system. Plants have immune systems, which translate to the human immune system when we eat the right immune system from plants. So I'll go over to Missy because that's one of the basic precepts of your whole approach in your in your company. Well it's an interesting thing because you and and I'm in the world of philanthropy so half of what he just said was right over my head. But uh, but I will say that um, it's really fascinating. I think probably everybody in this room has had something medically that when you get up against your choices, if it's bad enough, you're willing to look into this right here because you haven't found your answers in what was given to you, so you start seeking. And, um, and I have found on my own, and it wraps right into the question that you just asked, is when I treat myself in a way where I'm allowing that sustainable resource to whatever come to me, and, and it's a little bit of where you're going as well, that if we're treating the people on the ground in a way that they are not used to, in a lot of these areas when they are sourcing the agriculture that they're able to source within Kenya or Bulgaria or these different areas, and it's the highest risk of human trafficking, in the world in agriculture. And so labor trafficking is a much larger number of the human beings on this earth than, than a sex trafficking, although um, both are horrendous. Um, they are all linked to how human beings treat human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you take this model where you know your sourcing agents right on the ground and you're treating them with kindness and respect, fair on time payments for the first time in their lives, where they can get paid year round, that they can actually plan for their children to attend school because they have water in their systems. That they are, they're not, and we talked about this earlier in the philanthropy one, they're not taking six hours of their day to walk somewhere to pick up water to bring back to something. And the whole community lifts because of what you're sourcing there. And it goes back to your question on when people are treated better, they, they give back in a way that is sustainable, that is ethical, and you see the whole lift happen together. And that's what happens in a lot of our essential oils areas, and they're all over the world. It's um, in Brazil, it's Copaiba, um, which is a beautiful oil that's right up against CPD. You should look into it. Um, it's, there's frankincense in an area, really, really hard areas of tribal um, conflict in Somaliland. And we put a hospital in an area 12 hours in where there's no surgical care. And three years ago, we there was a concept, doTERRA put the money behind it, and we opened it last year. First time people are able to have surgical care in that region. And you start to see the whole lift of an area and the people wanting to be part of these solutions, and they've never had the option before. So exactly what you're saying in, in the products come then, you know, to the user, and um, and they're in pure form, and and 
and then we test purity. We do all of the things. We work with the University of Mississippi to test purity along the way and make sure that what is coming in that bottle is exactly what was given at the source. And this is why we call it functional. I want to emphasize it. Uh, prior to us choosing this term functional, it was a pejorative term in medicine. It was either rehabilitative or it was psychosomatic. That's the way those terms were used. Someone asked me in 1990 when we started down this road, why did I choose that term? It seemed that that had a negative connotation. I said because the puck was moving in the scientific literature towards functional radiology, functional cardiology, functional endocrinology. It was talking about the precedent to pathology. That's where all the action is. By the time you get to pathology, that cell has undergone that tissue, that organ, that organ system, a lot of irreparable damage. And now you're into uh, patchwork uh, magic medicine. Uh, that's where pharmacology and surgery comes to play. Before that are functional changes. And function means across all aspects of the systemic function. That's why I talked about uh, physical function, metabolic function, cognitive and behavioral function. They have to be intermersed. So it requires a systematic approach, which we're not doing in the way we train doctors, or we, we're not training doctors that way. I think it is in change. But the system that we have, which we call healthcare, is a total centric disease care system in which health is not actually uh, advanced as an operative value system. Uh, we call that a public health model, which is a stepchild to the disease care system of patchwork interventional medicine. We would need to have a comparable balance between health care, which is around function, and disease care. We don't give away disease care. We're lucky to be in this country and have the world's best, probably, uh, disease care. But we need a health care system that deals with function. Satya, I want to bring you in. Uh, Missy said something a few moments ago that, that struck me as, I think, inarguable, that there are times in many of our lives or the lives of people we love where there's a condition that may drive us to seek outside of the uh, traditional healthcare system. When you're in that position, though, how do you know whether you're in good hands? How do you know whether you're working with somebody who's actually qualified and is going to help, not hurt? I believe in this time uh, we still have to have a lot of references of these people because there's a lot of... Um, how do you say, people that they are not qualified to help others. But I, I would like to bring this to another topic that is highly important, that is, I, th I believe that in our healthcare system, not only in the United States, but in Europe, we, we give much more attention to the consequence of a disease, but we don't ask ourselves why this person is in pain, what is going on with them. We ask what is wrong with them. Yeah? And when we ask what is wrong with them, we immediately uh, put a boundary between how can I really help this person to recover their balance, their own wisdom and health. Not only wisdom on the emotional level or mind level, but physically. Uh, one of my biggest fights now in the United Nations is how to introduce awareness classes, awareness, self-awareness classes to the educational systems since they are kids to university. Because what I really see uh, by working with people the last 15 years, more than 60,000 people with cancer, politicians, mothers, uh, engineers, anyone that you uh, can point is, we all have a lot of traumas, all. There's no one in this room outside that you don't have trauma. All that trauma causes pain pain that is in your body, is manifested in, in your cells, not only in, in the um, bones or tissues, in the vibration of your cell. Uh, pain in your emotional body, in, uh, emotional body, we can say, emotional system, where you will not allow yourself to feel certain emotions because you are defending yourself against the pain that once you felt. So you will pass your life running away from situations that you believe that can bring you more pain. So that doesn't allow you to really live a fully life. So that happens mentally. So you have a belief system that you got from your childhood and from your social life, but not only, by your genes. So 
when we need to look to a human being, we need to look from a more uh, holistic approach. How can the quality of your thoughts, your inner dialogue every day are influence your metabolism, inflammation, immune system, how the emotions that you repress are not allowing yourself to overcome your own fears. And honestly, by working with a lot of politicians and people that they are uh, leading companies, uh, they tell me, Satya, I already did everything therapy, uh, meditation. And one of the biggest tools that we can give to people is a, a safe space for them to be highly honest with themselves. And it's not easy to look where you were hurt and how your body is manifesting that pain and how you defend yourself so you don't allow yourself to really go to healing. That is the cause, the root of your pain. And by doing this, so I, I was sexual abused. I, mean, I, I come from a very high standard culture family, okay? I never went to difficult situations in terms of economical um, situation. And uh, sexual abuse happens uh, in every family. Uh, in, for example, in groups retreats that I have in 40 people, normally when we do the medical inquiry in the first interview, they around 20 and normally women, they say, that have at least one situation that they consider sexual abuse, okay? Normally, when we finish the retreats, we have 38 people, men and women, that they consider that they were sexual abused. And this is one trauma. There's much, much more, okay? Um, neglected, uh, p parents, they were working too late, they don't have the right attention. All of you went through this. If I would be with you in my uh, office, whatever is the name, you would come to a place that you would feel that your trauma is still alive. So all these years I've been looking for how to really help people. So when they come with uh, physical um, uh, pain, I always send them to doctors. We work a lot with doctors. And most of the, the what they really say they can't really find in analysis because there's a lot that is psychosomatic. So I went to therapy, meditation, all the arts of healing that I could, and one that I found was natural psychedelics. Natural psychedelics from ancient traditions. And what I see in natural psychedelics is they, they allow the, the mechanism of uh, self-defense uh, network of the brain to get low. So they have access to memories, they have access to what? To the truth of what was going on inside of them. So when we use these natural psychedelics, people have the, the opportunity in a faster way than psychotherapy to really see what is inside. And by doing this, by saying this, I work a lot with cancer. And a lot of the cancers that people have uh, and doing analysis before with our doctors and after the retreat, what we find is normally the, um, the levels of cancers, the cancer in our system drops a lot. Many people, I can give you percentage after, many people, they really are clean of the cell, uh, cancer cells. And many people that they can't heal themselves because their body is not anymore available to have the physical healing, what happens is they are more than ready to accept death. By saying this is to forgive what they need to forgive about themselves, to make peace with people that they couldn't before, that they have a true meaning, they can see the meaning of their lives, what brought them to that place, and if we can help people to really be with themselves and to die in peace, that is a big conquer. We don't speak about death, only numbers, but we don't speak how can we help people to really die in peace. And for that, we need to teach kids that we have amount of time available and it really counts. And we are all afraid to speak about this. Yes? As we are afraid to say that I'm in pain. So, Self-awareness, natural psychedelics, it's one of the oldest tools and one of the most futuristic tools. And why? Because 
it helps us to come to a point of being self-aware. What is going on with me? How do I really feel? Why do I feel like that? And many people with addictions, uh, we still um, put them in a place that they have something wrong with them. And most of us have addictions, sugar addictions, TV addictions, sex addictions, toxic relation addictions. And we need to really look to that and to help people to ask themselves, how do I arrive here? How do I got here? And normally, the pain, emotional pain, is there. I'm just going to jump in just because I, I have my eye on the clock, and I just want to make sure I give everybody enough, enough uh, of an opportunity to talk. Dan, let me just come back to you for a second. Um, can you just, um, th this discovery around Blue Zones is just so interesting, and I know it's been out there for a minute, but it's, it's, I, I suspect not everybody here has immersed themselves in it. Can you distill for us the practical learnings? What have you changed about your life? after learning about the Blue Zones? What, do, what are the habits you have that you would recommend we all have? So by way of background, so we find five Blue Zones. The longest lived men in the world live in the highlands of, of Sardinia. Uh, the longest lived women live in the archipelago of Okinawa. Uh, an island off of Turkey named Ikaria, you have a place where people are suffering about half the rate of cardiovascular disease and about one-tenth the rate of dementia that we do in the United States. In the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, uh, this is a place uh, dominated by the Contras in the 1980s, but uh, they have about half the rate of middle age mortality than we do in the United States, and they spend 1 15th the amount we do on health care. And by the way, I just want to sort of salute my fellow panelists here because, you know, the, the health care system that we all rely on uh, since 1980, the the uh, number of people suffering from diabetes has gone up by about a factor of seven. The number of chronic disease among middle-aged people has doubled. Uh, the rate of dementia has gone up by some uh, estimates sevenfold. Obesity has gone up by a factor of three. It ain't working. And the people sitting here, my fellow colleagues, they're taking the risk. They're being challenged. But yet, keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different outcome is the definition of insanity. At least they're coming up with these uh, innovative, and in, 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 in at least your case, you're, you're, you're uh, bringing back uh, wisdom that has evolved over uh, millennia and putting it to work in patients today, and, and I really applaud that. And similarly to your question, Dan, about um, what are the insights from Blue Zones. Well, if you look at the common denominators, all five of these Blue Zones, we did a meta-analysis. If you want to know what a 100-year-old ate to live to be 100, you can't just ask them because people don't remember. If I asked you what you had for lunch a week ago Tuesday, you probably wouldn't remember. So you can't exactly ask a 100-year-old, you know, what's your diet? But you can find these dietary surveys, and we found 155 of them done in all five blue zones over the last 80 years. They go back 80 years. And uh, what these people were really eating as kids in middle age and newly retired and, and, and to a certain extent now, although that's changing, uh, 90 to 95 percent whole food plant-based. Five pillars of every longevity diet in the world are whole grains of every sort, tubers, greens, nuts, and the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. If you want to know a supplement that really works, beans. Take 125 of them every day. It's the best supplement there. It's associated with about four extra years of life expectancy. So I become mostly plant-based. I eat a little bit of fish. Uh, but, but the other thing, you know, I, I wrote a cover story for National Geographic in 2005, and it was one of their most uh, popular. And um, I had identified that um, having a strong sense of purpose is worth about eight years of, of life expectancy over going rudderless in life. But no, nobody in the pharmaceutical industry is talking about purpose. In fact, there's no drug that I know of, including statins, that can impart seven or eight years of life expectancy. If you could put purpose in a pill, it'd be a blockbuster drug. Uh, being socially connected. Uh, there's this great uh, Okinawan word, moai, um, uh, four or five people you travel through life with. And so I've created my own moai. I'm very clear on my sense of purpose. I eat a, um, mostly a whole food plant-based diet. Um, I you know, tend to put my family first. and. Uh, um, I have these sacred daily rituals that help me reduce inflammation every day, um, including um, uh, taking a moment to slow down, 
um, meditation. I have my own version of meditation and happy hour. <laughs> so it <laughs> seems to work. Oh, wait, so in the blue zones, uh, they can have happy hour. Yeah, they do have happy hour. Yes, it's a very important, especially in the Mediterranean area. There's some version in every blue zone except for Loma Linda, California, and they're not supposed to drink, but they do. <laughs> uh, where, what's the view from the blue zone on Oreos? <laughs> they're a very well-rounded meal. No, I don't know. No, no, no. no they almost, uh, um, until about 2000, at uh, the year 2000, um, highly processed food was unknown to the Blue Zones, as were su sugar-sweetened beverages. And you can see very clearly when the American um, uh, way of eating, American food culture arrives, their obesity starts to spike, the diabetes spikes, and their life expectancy drops. And, and, the, and the bad news about all these blue zones is they're all disappearing because of the influence mm. of the United States and, and the way we eat. And, mm. and um, so it's very clear to me, you know, as my fellow um, panelists, as they're looking at the outside the body for um, solutions for healing. It's a much more fertile terrain than continue to, you know, hit the dead horse of, of you know, pharmaceuticals to, to fix our problems. Jeffrey, you got something? I just want to really reinforce what Dan just said. I think it's really brilliant. So I mentioned this uh, ancient food, uh, tartary buckwheat, 4,000 year old uh, food. Um, so where is that food originally cultivated 4,000 years ago? On the slopes of the Himalayan mountains. Pretty hostile, bad soils, horrible climate. So these plants uh, had to evolve extraordinary mechanisms of survival. They have their immune systems. They produce 451 different phytochemicals. 55 of those are members of the polyphenol family that have been shown by immunological science now to be strongly um, supportive of both innate and adaptive immune system function. So these plants have a super immune system capability that then gets transferred through the ecosystem by people who eat those foods into their ability to perform high level work over the course of eight or nine decades of good living. And when, I, when Dan made the comment about what happened to our food supply system and how it weaves itself into uh, pharmacology of today, it's a very interesting story. You recall the McGovern Committee. I was starting my career as a young professor in the McGovern Committee in the 60s. And that was the first national priority of food uh, policy. Um, uh, in fact, we didn't have another one until the fall last year with uh, uh, Biden's uh, conference on uh, food, hunger, and, and health. And that particular committee, you recall, came up with recommendations, so-called dietary uh, goals. The dietary goals, uh, got perverted. I won't go through the whole history, but let me just tell you what they said. They said, uh, saturated fat is bad, everything else is good. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point. So what happened to the food industry? The food industry was very smart because now they could take saturated fat out and replace it with very inexpensive carbohydrates, particularly high refined and sucrose. That was the start of the high fructose corn syrup sweetener revolution. Now, in those period of years, from 1962 until the McGovern uh, report was uh, published as dietary goals in the 70s, um, the food industry got a head start. We never had metabolic syndrome. There was no such thing as insulin resistance. We didn't even talk about it in medicine. Uh, when I learned diabetes in medical school in the 60s, it was an insulin deficiency syndrome. Now we have an insulin excess syndrome that's related to insulin resistance. And where did that all come from? Is it coincidental that it came at the same time in which we were starting to see the proliferation of high fructose corn syrup sweetened foods. We're starting to see hyperuricemia, starting to see gout. All these things were a manifestation of a government policy supporting a food change, which then drove the pharmaceutical industry to have 12 different drugs approved for diabetes, for a whole series of new antihypertensive medications, for the whole uh, epidemic of obesity. There was a marriage of American pharmaceutical technology with the iatrogenic cause by changing dietary habits, agricultural patterns, subsidy for farmers. This is a systemic problem that we are forgetting to, to uh, bring back to our history and not re reproduce it. What he's talking about is a whole network biology approach towards true health, not disease. That's what functional medicine is all about. Jill, let me bring, bring you back in. We're, we're hearing these really interesting ideas about um, changing your diet, um, potentially looking into psychedelics, adding more purpose into your life. I'm wondering, is a challenge for you in your practice with your patients uh, the difficulty of human behavior change? Because 
making and breaking habits, we know from the data, is, is diabolically difficult. So, so how do you deal with that, and, and is it a big problem? Yeah, you know, they say it's harder to change your diet than your religion. <laughs> Um, and I think it's true in some cases. So behavior is, is important, but I feel like the foundation of what we're doing as clinicians and, and changing the way we practice medicine is actually how do we encounter the patient in the office? Mm -hmm. Do we create a safe space, like you talked about, for them to be present and feel accepted and loved? One of the biggest new terms last year, I think the biggest word search for Google was gaslighting. There's something called medical gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And that's when you go into your doctor and you say, doctor, you know, I haven't been feeling well. I'm not sleeping. Um, maybe it's hormones. I've got headaches. I'm exhausted. Stress is high. Um, and I just don't feel like myself. The doctor orders a CBC, a CMP, a routine panel of labs and looks at them and says, well, everything looks normal. Um, do you want an antidepressant? Now, there's nothing against antidepressants. They're perfectly appropriately used. But this is not a depression issue. This is a systemic biology issue of dysfunction. And just because they haven't yet hit that code for ICD-10 to qualify for lupus or you name the disease, migraine headaches, the doctor blows them off and says it must be all in your head. And this is what we're dealing with. And this is why it's important to start with a foundation where a patient comes in and there's this, this what we used to have is the trust built foundation of a physician patient encounter. And that's lost in a seven minute visit, which is the average of most doctors. So we need to have this built-in way to have a patient come in, connect with their physician on a human level, be heard and be seen for themselves, and then ask about questions like, what about childhood trauma? What about, how is you, your sleep? What are the stressors in your life? On my intake form, I say, what is your greatest source of strength? How do you relieve stress? Mm -hmm. These things are not typically asked in a seven-minute encounter. And this is how we change the encounter, because when you have that relationship with your physician, that's where the healing starts. Missy, you want you had something? Yeah. Um, so I worked a lot in anti-trafficking, and I started that. I was um, chief of staff to the Utah Attorney General, and that's really where I started to really heavily get into this issue. I had seen it earlier um, in an organization that I founded, the Utah Refugee Coalition, because it's high within the refugee populations. Once I started getting into that, and I don't know if you're all aware of the Children's Justice Centers or the um, there's a network of um, advocacy centers for children. One of the books that they utilize for this trauma support is called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. It is one of the best books on childhood trauma and also trauma that came through um, war. And it's really that those two populations um, are really the most trauma-induced adults. And this book talks about how the body holds this. Mm -hmm. And it is a very clinical approach to this. So if you want just a clinical entry into this, it's a great one to go to if your brain is just, this is overwhelming you. Um, because it's one that could resonate with anybody reading it. And, um, and you see that, that we are as a system, we are as a nation and even internationally, we're starting to recognize the importance of spirituality in our healing. We're understanding um, how holistic approaches to things really matter. And um, I see it in the oils where uh, there are trafficked um, survivors who will tell me that they were put on drugs to get off of drugs mm -hmm. because of what they were using to cope in a trafficked scenario. And that the only thing that is supporting them is an oil we have that is a, called adaptive. And I, I find it like I will be at a panel with these survivors speaking and they'll all pull it out of their purse and unmedose to me, I'm, I say to them, why do you use it? I can't live without it. And it's, it doesn't last long, but it gets them past that trauma response of the, of the immediate peak of a trauma, um, you know, if there's something reflective in and something um, pushes them into that trauma space. So it's amazing because people tell me all the time, they testify to me all the time how the oils work. And, and I've had my own experiences with them and that would go on a long time. But I'm just saying, it's just trying things. And me and my own life, it's just, trying things and seeing what works and just what you said it's the results if it's not working try something else you know it's not a lot of these things are not 
detrimental to you because they're naturally based they're you know so just try it we've got about 10 minutes left i want to give a chance to people for people in the room to ask questions apparently there's some technological thing where you can get them to this ipad but i'm uh not going to figure out how to use that <laughs> right now so let's use the old way of actual uh uh there's a speaking microphone right so there. that when there's a microphone in the back so and who's got a question put your hand up we'll get a mic to you Oh, thank you. I always appreciate the first person who raises their hand. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a question. Do you think uh, insurance companies can play a role in pushing more functional medicine that's more cost effective, it seems, in the long run than kind of the traditional approaches? I can give a quick shot at Great. that. Um, one of the major imperatives now of the Institute for Functional Medicine, which just is celebrating its 32nd year now, uh, is to really uh, work with government agencies and, and insurance uh, providers to really talk through how you use the insurance system equitably to support um, improved function, which is improved resilience. You notice I'm staying away from the word prevention because once you get into prevention as a term, then you're talking about preventing a disease. You're now into the disease lexicon. You're into that whole system. In terms of resilience, which then has to do with the com you know, compression of morbidity and improving a health span, the question is what would you be measuring and how would you determine outcome? What are the variables that you'd use? And I'm very uh, excited to say that uh, maybe as a consequence of what we just went through with COVID, uh, it has been really a kind of a relaxing of some of the guidelines as to how one would then do an office visit, either by telemedicine or in office, to actually collect the variables that would really talk about functional capability, not just the absence of pathology. I think we're witnessing the first vestiges of the creation of a new model that uh, then gets really uh, with uh, uh, generative AI, uh, where we're collecting all sorts of information into systems thinking that make it easier for the doctor to collect this data set. And uh, now we have 24-7, 365 information from our wearable devices for the first time in human history. All of that information now can be reimbursed uh, as part of preventive care, to using the word prevention. And so I think we're witnessing a transformative uh, uh, opportunity to really redefine the nature of a practitioner to the reimbursement system to the patient so the patient becomes center uh, point in the uh, intervention. Next question. Um, so I have a question around where does integrative health fit in within this whole functional medicine approach because we're talking about a lot of what you are saying seems like you know there is the disease care and then there's the health care and within integrative medicine I think there's a little bit of that where they want to go into root cause uh, you know looking at the root cause uh, and there are companies now which are doing that so you know partially health comes to mind and they're now covered by insurance companies uh, so one is that and the other is you know you touched upon this thing about systems biology uh, and you know the different organ systems working together and a lot of eastern healing modalities and like meditation and stuff comes from there they talk about that they've always talked about that right in chinese medicine in ayurveda uh, so would love your thoughts on kind of uh, the two of these topics so i'll just say a quick thing and i'll turn it over to the jill and the rest of the group but I had the privilege of being invited to um, do a series of lectures at Beijing University Medical School and Hospital in, uh, a number of years ago. And I was actually really uh, very privileged to have the chief of staff of, of the largest hospital in China that uh, had his whole senior staff attend my lecture, believe it or not. It was trans translated, uh, obviously. I'm not that fluent in China, Chinese. And, and, uh, and so um, at the end of the presentation, which lasted several hours. Uh, we were having an award ceremony, giving one another gifts. And, uh, and when, when it was his turn to, to speak to me, he was speaking in Chinese, and he went on and on and on. And my translator, his eyes were very big. And I, and I finally said, what is he saying? You know, and he's, he's going on and on. And he said, he just said that you're the first American that seemed to understand traditional Chinese medicine. <laughs> so th this is a systems approach. It goes back historically through um, uh, empiricism. People make these observations over thousands of years. They get codified into habit patterns, which ultimately become the policies and procedures. If all you have is na nature to be your teacher, you don't yet have the pharmacopoeia of uh, single new to nature molecules, then you learn about the uh, stories that those plants can teach you in ways that are very different than looking at the stories from a single molecule against a single receptor against a single outcome. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Joe. Um, 
I'm sort of uh, board certified in integrative medicine and also family medicine, so I can t speak to this. Years ago, the term alternative was everything that wasn't allopathic. Everything else was thrown in this bucket. I hate that term because alternative to what? And why is that you know ranking order the value? Then we got integrative. Integrative is uh, Andrew Weil made this really popular with his classes and board certifications and many books. Integrative is all these wonderful modalities. When I was in medical school, that's what we brought in, <laughs> massage therapists, Ayurvedic practi practitioners, naturopathic doctors, chiropractic physicians, and all of these types of people, and many more that I'm not naming, <laughs> um, you know, just for lack of time. All of these people had ad added value, and they were practitioners in their own right that had a system of healing. <laughs> and the integrative approach was bringing all that together, and as a doctor, you might do a referral to these pieces and use them. And then before I knew what functional medicine was, this is what I went into medical school to do. And what I find my colleagues like myself get reinvigorated when they find out functional medicine exists and what it is because we learned chemistry, biology, systems, systems biology in medical school. But after the first and second year, we're in classrooms, we go into the clinic and we learned get a ICD-10 code, here's your diagnosis, here's a drug. There's nothing wrong with that, but you lose that systems biology thinking. So functional medicine, is taking this as a clinician in my practice, looking at all the data. I do loads and loads of tests, pretty much every body fluid you can imagine, saliva, urine, stool, because I'm looking at the microbiome, I'm looking, I'm looking under the hood of the car. So I'm saying, what is happening in this car, just like your mechanic would, diagnostically to say, why is it making that funny noise, right? It might be your migraine headaches. So why is this problem happening? I'm looking under the hood of the car and looking at all your metabolic processes and saying, what process is going wrong? In conventional medicine, we're taught to get that code and that's the end of the line, then there's a drug to treat that. Nothing wrong with that, but you're not looking under the hood of the car. So the functional medicine, that is actually what you do as a medical doctor or an allopathic physician or, or an osteopathic physician or an, any other practitioner in the clinic to look at root cause. So hopefully that kind of explains those. Sir. Quick question. Clinical studies, you just mentioned data, the one you use and the test and all that. The, the standard accusation against um, functional medicine and the, and the rest is that they're not the same level of clinical studies. They're not published, they're not peer reviewed, they're not widely available, they're not tested. Can you comment on that? Yes. I, I, I can certainly comment on that because that's one of my areas of res responsibility within the Institute for Functional Medicine. Um, I think your point is very well taken that early on in the development of the model, now as I said it's 32 years since IFM was first formed, um, it was pretty much empiricism and uh, kind of uh, creating uh, hypotheses and then testing it to see if clinically patients were responding to it. Over the last uh, five or I would say seven years, however, because of the Cleveland Clinic opportunity and the availability of a really high-powered research staff with uh, informatics specialists and biometricians, uh, we've started now to actually publish outcome studies in respectable journals like JAMA. And uh, those studies are showing very positive outcomes when compared against uh, standards of practice, which are the best available, say, family practice uh, standards of care. So there's nothing wrong with those. They produce positive outcomes, but in head-to-head -head comparisons, the outcome with a functional medicine model produced more positive outcomes. And now there are a whole array of those studies that have been published uh, with autoimmune disease, with a variety of different maladies. And as you probably know, one of the things that we're experiencing now are new conditions that are coming up like PANS, uh, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders in kids, or, or autism, or greater allergies, or increasing frequency of autoimmune dis disorders. Our genes didn't change. What changed is the environment in which the genes are exposed, and so it requires a new model. We just can't come out with new immunosuppressive drugs and treat all of these conditions. We have to go upstream and ask, what can we do to take away the bad things and add the right things on an individual basis to produce a better patient outcome, more cost effective, and reduce this unnecessary burden of disease? One last question. So uh, somebody said that um, science is usually way ahead of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, and somebody even calibrated it as something like 17 years. And part of the problem is not just getting FDA approvals, but it's getting doctors to keep up with what the latest science is telling you, including in areas of functional medicine. So how do we change that paradigm to shorten it so that doctors who are otherwise under a lot of pressure and are well-intentioned uh, but under a lot of pressure to make money, to ch you know, churn their patients, how do you change the paradigm that the, the, this gap between science and medicine gets shorter? 
So I, I want to speak to that because one of the things that has happened in my life, which is extraordinarily rewarding personally, is I was told when we started the Institute for Functional Medicine that we would never be able to recruit doctors into this. They'd have to go back and open their books about chemistry and anatomy, physiology, and that's the last thing they wanted to do. Their lives were already complicated. They're just being recertified by their annual uh, certification exams, and they take a minimum number of courses for CEs to get certification. So uh, I, I was uh, living in a la-la land if I was thinking that people were going to go back and really put their minds to this. Well, that was totally, I was proven, I think, to be right that there are extraordinarily passionate people who want to pre, uh, do the best job for their patients. We've had 250,000 over the last 32 years, 250,000 doctors come to our courses. And they're not easy, as Jill would say. They're very demanding. And what that reaffirms is this transformational opportunity for physicians to be re-enchanted with why they went into medicine, which is to really help people, not to become prescribers of somebody else's details, but for them to actually develop an intimate relationship with their patients that produces positive outcome. That's really a reaffirming for me in these 40 years I've been in the field. You brought us right up to the end of our allotted time. Thank you very much to our panelists. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks. Thanks.